Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Zoe. I'm Matthew. And today we're going to talk to you about magic and meaning making and a bit about the work that we do. Yeah. So together we form Pseudomagic. We are missing one member uh, in the company here today. Uh, who we will give you just a brief introduction to as we go along here. Um, Pseudomagic was formed in 2020. It was a lovely time to found a company, especially in February, as we were. A uh, strange time, to say the very least. Um, we're very happy that we've been successful all along the way, despite some a few bumps here and there. And one of the fun things about Pseudomagic, I think, kind of stems from our name uh, and how we think about ourselves. Yeah, so pseudo magic. We were we were sitting in a cafe in Sacramento, trying to figure out what to name this business. We had met each other many years ago, trying to figure out, you know, what the intersection was of all of our interests. Um, we all love magic uh, and spell casting. We think of code and writing code as a way of casting spells. And so we were like, okay, we, we love magic. And we were like trying to figure it out. And then we're like, it's like it's like pseudo magic, pseudo p s e u. Uh, Do however you spell it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we were like pseudo, and they're like, but it should be pseudo. Super user, yeah, super user do magic, which is of course the Linux command, uh, pseudo, and so that's how we we got to where we are today. A strange world. The three of us were a small company. Uh, the three of us uh, actually met in 2015. Uh, at a conference that was being held at Arizona State University called Emerge that was focused on the intersection of art and technology and storytelling. Uh, the interesting kind of like, you know, turn of events that the universe unfolds for you. Ian and I both were uh, graduate students at the time, uh, and Zoe was visiting from UCLA, and it only took us five years to actually form a company after meeting those many years ago. Yeah, uh, at the time, uh, I was working at UCLA. So um, my background, I am a filmmaker by training. Um, I specialized in documentary production. Um, but then one of my professors showed me this like really cool interactive uh, kind of piece. It was Wilderness Downtown, the Arcade Fire piece. And I was like, oh, that's that's really cool. Like, I didn't know those things exist. And so I. I was really interested in making interactive stories. I wanted people to be able to tell their own stories. And so I kind of made my way over into theater, got really excited about the liveness, the part participatoriness, um, and started working at Remap, where we did work uh, creating open source tracking tools. Uh, one is called Open P Track, that was all body based tracking. Um, and from there, I wanted to continue making work, and so I did my MFA at UC Santa Cruz, uh, specializing in games and thinking about how uh, I could engage participants in the stories and the worlds that I, I created. And so a lot of my work has a big documentary focus, um, focusing on my family, my Mexican family's immigration to the United States, and then my Venezuelan family's diaspora uh, here uh, in the United States as well. And so uh, a lot of my work is also at Pseudomagic doing a bunch of kind of user experience design, playtesting, creative direction, and all that, all that good stuff. Yeah, I come to this work by way of theater. I was an actor, dancer, circus performer once upon a time. That feels like a lifetime ago these days. Uh, and as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, um, you know, while suspended from the ceiling, upside down, wrapped up in a piece of fabric, uh, I, <laughs> where you do all your best thinking, clearly, <laughs> geez. Um, I started to think about what were the intersections and what were the pieces that were really exciting and compelling to me. That was at a time uh, right around when the ICM tour was first happening with this kind of modular projection system. And I remember seeing that and thinking like, oh, like that's what I want to go study. That's what I want to do. So I found my way to ASU imagining that, you know, the questions were going to be answered in a textbook and like the answers would unfold uh, while working with professors. And instead I found a lot more questions uh, and a whole host of elements that hadn't really been uncovered for me yet. Uh, and so that was where I actually started a lot of my interrogation of thinking about what is some of this interac uh, intersection between creativity uh, and expressive creative coding. At the time, there was not a lot of documentation on the internet uh, for using tools like Touch Designer. And one of the commitments I'd made to my advisor before leaving for college was that I was going to write about whatever it is that I did. So I started writing tutorials largely, uh, imagining like who else in the community would benefit from, the, from this, and also trying to think about what is it that I wished had existed if, you know, when I was a student, if I were to reflect back on what could I leave behind for 
you know, a future me. And that eventually transitioned me out of Arizona. I joined, um, at the time, Obscure Digital out of San Francisco. We were an interactive agency that kind of had two disciplines. We were focused on kind of live events and permanent installations. We were eventually acquired by Madison Square Garden Company, where I worked for a little bit uh, and did some of the initial work with Sphere before departing uh, to start Pseudomagic. Yeah, funny enough, Touch Designer is the reason that uh, Ian, Matt, and I met because we were at a conference and I was like, who's using this software? People aren't really using this. Mm. And then Ian kind of, we, Ian is the glue that hook, hook, hooked us all together. Ian's not here, but uh, he says hello from San Jose. Uh, Ian is our resident uh, backend wizard, web wizard, and lighting designer. Um, he's done work for, uh, he did the lighting design and work for the Empire State Building during the pandemic. There was like a remote Simon Says game happening. Um, and he's done a bunch of kind of interactive pieces. He does a lot of our kind of work with sensing technologies as well. Yeah. So what do we do at Pseudomagic? There's a laundry list of things in front of you. Right, which seems like an impossible collection of different things, everything from previs and XR stages to volumetric rendering, data visualizations, generative design, yada, 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 yada. I think what's interesting, especially for us, having come, uh, all three of us, uh, from backgrounds that kind of took us through MFA programs, uh, all of us at one time or another had the responsibility of understanding a complete pipeline flow for a user experience and for an immersive experience. And because of that, we. Uh, I think the three of us tended to think about how do we approach these ideas, not just from the kind of specific, how do we solve this problem for this project, but how do we understand the concept so that we can apply it to different kinds of uh, installations and experiences. And in a lot of circumstances, many of the things that we take for granted as being dissimilar actually share some of the same founding principles. Um, things that we like to tell people is that XR stages are really like projection mapping inside out. It's kind of like you flip the idea uh, on its head. And so many of these things share similar, similar characteristics. We've worked in lots of different platforms. The tools that we use kind of, you know, run a wide gamut of different kinds of interfaces. Um, but really, many of them are based on kind of understanding very similar concepts. So we'll just like play this in the background, a little kind of highlight of some of the projects that we've done uh, the past couple years. One of the first projects we did was lighting design for the W Hotel in Abu Dhabi. We did this entirely remotely. It was during the pandemic. So, you know, GoPro was our best friend for the folks on the ground. That was amazing. Uh, we also worked on this broadcast project. Matt, do you want to talk a little bit? Yeah, you know, XR stages are strange places to be, and we worked on a piece that was a live auction for Audemars Piguet. Um, it's a really phenomenal experience to be both behind a giant wall of LEDs uh, when a production's happening. And then recently we did this project at CalArts. It was Visions 2030. We'll talk more about this project specifically, as well as the Frida Immersive Experience. This we did in collaboration with Coco Lab, uh, an amazing uh, production studio outside, uh, inside of Mexico City. And this was kind of this ambulatory immersive experience uh, that covered the life of Frida Kahlo. We're also no stranger to uh, lab work and research work. We've worked with both institutions and we also carry on a fairly robust uh, degree of internal research to try and understand what things are coming next, how do we approach different projects, how do we solve problems uh, that are on the horizon or that don't have good solutions yet. I think a lot of times we, we kind of answer questions for clients where they come with like a pie in the sky idea uh, and there might be an off-the-shelf component that has, you know, one too many zeros behind the first number for a particular activation. And so we often try to think about what other techniques and tools can we use to solve some of those problems. Yeah, and a lot of the projects we do, we do kind of a mix of corporate work because that pays the bills, but then we do a lot of research initiatives as well. Um, most recently, we did a project with the NSF via UCLA, um, kind of looking at what does my bike mobility look like in a city like Los Angeles? How can folks uh, move safely in Los Angeles uh, in kind of like pods of bike crews? So we've done everything from kind of larger scale projects to smaller research projects. We also are, you know, we've had the lovely opportunity of having uh, a long lasting relationship with the with the folks at Derivative. They're really wonderful uh, human beings all around. I think one of the reasons we continue to use Touch Designer to this day 
is partially because the community is tremendously welcoming. They're a lovely group of people to interact with. Uh, and Derivative as a company is also uh, remarkable to work with. I mean, if you've ever deployed a project with something like Unreal or Unity, you wouldn't necessarily expect that a support ticket would like return back to you a custom build. Uh, and that's often some of the experience that we've had with the folks at Derivative, that if we uncover a problem, they are really excited about trying to help solve that. To that end, uh, we worked with them to develop their uh, learning curriculum, um, which is focused on a fundamentals course that's intended for instructors and for learners uh, who need like bite-sized ways to remix content to fit inside of curriculum. I think both of us have, as instructors have faced the challenge of how do you teach something that's a complex topic that there are many different ways to solve problems with. And we wanted to try and find a remixable solution that other people could use. Yeah, this was a project that we actually just launched earlier this year. Uh, it had been something that they had been wanting to make for a while. Um, and I think Matt's like prolific uh, creation of content over the years. Uh, we just started talking to, to about it to them like offhandedly. And then, you know, we spent uh, two years collaborating with them to create um, this kind of robust, detailed curriculum that's the fundamentals of touch designer in essentially five to seven minute video chunks. And so it's a a video archive of all these this content and you can also download projects to see examples so it was a really fun kind of educational initiative that we did since we both taught in the past and so when we started pseudomagic we hadn't taught in a long time and we kind of were having that itch to want to do more uh, kind of teaching so this was really a great opportunity yeah i think one of the other really interesting pieces that we uncovered in this process is that it is remarkably challenging to describe <laughs> a complex topic in as short as five minutes uh, it feels like you have just enough time to uh, uncover the problem and then your time has run out so it was a great exercise in trying to think about how to be both concise mm -hmm. uh, and find very specific examples that helped illustrate points uh, for both instructors and for learners. Mm -hmm. To that end, we have a few case studies to, to share with you all today. Uh, not that we're not fascinating and interesting all by ourselves, um, but we thought it would be useful to share a few projects that we've worked on to give you a sense of the kind of work that we do and both the perspective that we bring to the work uh, and work that is interesting and compelling to us. Yeah, so we'll talk of, about three case studies. The first is the Frida Kahlo exhibition. The second is Visions 2030. And the last one is Calaveras, uh, one of the most recent projects that we did. So the first project, Frida, uh, was an immersive experience that ran for uh, about a year and a half in Mexico City. It ran in this beautiful Art Deco building in the Fronton in Mexico City. And this was a previously a high ally stadium, which is pretty wild and pretty awesome. It's an amazing magical space that they've converted. Um, and so uh, we got the opportunity to work with Coco Lab uh, to put on this experience. So we'll just play this. So what's interesting about this project is that it was happening, it, it had originally started in 2020, and then they had to pause for some time to figure out how they were actually going to continue on the production with everything closed down. And what was really great about it was that uh, the team at Coco Lab was essentially also responding to the proliferation of the Van Gogh experiences. You all know what I'm talking about, the kind of 
slideshow presentation style, fully immersive projection rooms. Um, and they really did not want this to be that. And so that was kind of one of the key pieces that they were dialogue, in dialogue with at the time. Um, some things to point out here is that the whole floor was covered in sand. And so when you walked into the space, it was kind of immediately slightly disorienting because you felt like the ground was just shifting around you. Um, and all of the canvases were slightly different sizes. They were tall. Some of them had cutouts of dresses. There was a large string curtain in the center. And there was a lot of, I think, attention to detail in the scenography and the story that they were telling about Frida's life. Not only did the space have all this projection and narrative and story, um, but there was like an, an accompanying app that had all the details about every single painting. So you could look at the app and then it would tell you about the painting and then there were side experiences where there was this kind of like exquisite corpse uh, style interactive piece. To just kind of outline some of the scenography that we saw. So there were 26 of those tall canvases that they were 21 feet tall. So it was pretty, pretty large scale generally. And then there was a center sculpture in the center of the space that had 650 handmade pieces of either blown glass or paper uh, flowers that were all crafted in Mexico City. And then in the center, there was a kinetic sculpture that would actually turn throughout the duration of the experience. So you would just kind of see that sway and move kind of like a dress and mirroring all of the dresses. What was interesting is that they had a lot of this uh, string curtain, which is, was beautiful. But of course, the string curtain came in a nice vibrant white color, which if you work with projection, you would think that's the color that you want, but it is not the color that you want. You want a nice matte gray so that you have more dynamic range in your color. And so they had to hand dye all of the string for all of that string curtain. And then there were, I think at the end of it, it was three tons of sand that they just you know, laid over. That was a, that was a moment. They were like, once we put the sand, there's no more, there's no more genie, there's no more, like ladders have to be, have to be very careful, like this is a, a moment, it was a. It's also a strange moment when someone says, oh, and we're gonna add three tons of sand. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah, of course, sure, why, why not? What was our role uh, in Frida? So we worked largely with the software team and we kind of worked hand in hand both with software and content. You know, one of the challenges for an experience like this is that there's no good kind of turnkey solution for how you're gonna solve some of these problems. You know, software has changed, it always changes over time, and so these days you might be able to accomplish many of the pieces uh, that we did in Frida with uh, something like Pixera or Disguise. At the time, there was not quite the infrastructure to support that, so part of what we wanted to do and part of the reason uh, we partnered with Cocoa Lab was to try and solve the problem of how do we connect many different machines to create a cohesive system that spans all of the projection, the interactive systems, uh, and then ties into their audio system. To give you a sense of how much technology was involved, there was uh, a rack of 17 machines that ran uh, all of the projection for the installation. There was 83 projectors uh, altogether. The main experience was, I think, 65. That's the most I've done. It was very exciting. Uh, there were 51 uh, sources of audio sped throughout the space. There was one show control system uh, that we helped them design and engineer that did all the coordination to make sure that the, ran, the show ran consistently. The transitions between the baked media pieces all happened with a custom particle system that was uh, distributed across all of the machines. And we ended up using two different projection mapping solutions, uh, both for the uh, ancillary spaces, as I described, and then one for the main primary space. Yeah, and what that looked like for us, so we worked kind of hand in hand with the content team and uh, the audio team, but our part really kind of got divvied up into four sections. So we built the show control system. So there were operators who ran the show daily. It was a 45 minute loop that they sold tickets for, um, but you could enter at any time and then stay for as long as you wanted. 
And so the operators had to have a way to be able to control that. There was the uh, projection mapping system that Matt mentioned, as well as the timeline playback tool. So Touch Designer is uh, a node-based pro programming environment where you kind of connect noodles together, and it I call them noodles, but they're wires. Um, and then it just runs, uh, and it runs in whatever order you tell it to. It's not like Premiere. It doesn't have that kind of linear control. And so this tool was built by Coco Lab to uh, actually sequence all of the content and sequence the show. And then that's uh, kind of a previs of the particle system that we used as well. Part of my specialty at Obscure Digital and at Madison Square Garden was understanding how to both engineer, develop, and deploy distributed systems. So a big part of uh, my role in working with their engineering team was to help kind of coordinate and drive a lot of the engineering around how do we build a show control system that uh, has a defined user interface and has like pieces for operators to control, but then also drives many headless machines that are actually making up all of the output con and control system. This is just kind of a quick snapshot for you of what the uh, software internal control panel looked like to give you a sense of how many different kind of like knobs and switches there existed for the system. And here we see the, the timeline uh, system that Zoe uh, mentioned. It's no small thing to coordinate many different machines to run at the same time and to make sure they run all of their content the way that's planned and to orchestrate many different layers uh, of that across those machines. So even though it feels like a single kind of cohesive experience for you as a visitor as an and as an attendee, things that we had to think about were what are the different layers on the kind of walls doing? What's happening on the floor? How is the cylinder spinning and reacting? And how are all of those elements coordinated and synchronized together? And so that was a lot of the work that was our focus. By the end, we were like, oh, oh, OK. Yeah, no, it's happening. It's ha everything is synchronized. We're good. OK, great, great. Everything is moving as intended. That was, those, were, those were the good moments when we finally kind of got it all uh, buttoned up. Yeah, I think the one other piece there that mm -hmm. I should mention is that the Lion share of the development for that happened remotely. You know, we were in California. Mex uh, all of this was happening in Mexico City. So we really didn't have the stack of 17 machines to kind of develop and test on. So we were really kind of operating with a single machine and a concept about how distribution worked in order to kind of make sure all of that would play nice in the sandbox and then deployed it to all the machines with the, you know, cross your fingers and hope that it's all going to work the way you expect. Yeah, and part of our work was also... Uh working with the content team because there were six, 16 projectors or 16 machines in one spare. And so that meant not every machine could play back the whole show. It, it could only play back a portion of the show. And so a lot of what we did is think about creating plates for the content team so that they could think about, okay, we're going to render all of this in a kind of cookie cut manner so that the, the show plays back in this you know seamless and cohesive way. Yeah, I think one of the things that we bring to a project like this, like Frida, is that having done uh, these experiences beginning to end and also having worked on both artwork and on engineering, we are, we're often bridge builders and translators between technical teams and artistic teams to try and communicate the importance or significance of the choices that you make and how those are going to have an impact on the experience that your visitors have. And so that was, I think, one of the challenges, you know, it's a challenge that you face with any creative project is to try and choose the objective that you're going to aim towards and then understand the consequences of the choices that you make along the way as you're designing systems. Yeah, but they still added the sand. We were like, do you really want to add the sand? That's going to make projection mapping kind of weird for us. And they're like, we need the sand. And we have to like, have the sand. Okay, well, we're, we're going to do the sand. It's going to be great. Another project that we worked on recently was Visions 2030 Earth Edition. Uh, this was a, a partially seated experience and partially ambulatory experience for uh, participants as they moved through three different domes and then landed in uh, a large gallery space. This was in uh, California at the campus of California. The Cal School of Arts. Cal Arts. Yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah. It was at. <laughs> Zach Gallarts. Uh, it happened actually um, a month and a half ago. It was 
very recent. Um, it was interesting because it was part of this larger festival uh, called Earth Edition that was all about sustainability and thinking about uh, climate conscious futures and uh, eco consciousness. And so our experience was part of this dome triptych. And so ours was the larger dome. And so you actually started on the left in the smaller dome and you sat around this kind of digital campfire of sorts that was a primer uh, for the experience to come, which was the second dome, which was uh, a kind of full uh, projection. You kind of sat back and looked up in kind of a planetarium style. Uh, and it kind of gave you this very- Psychedelic experience. Aspirational, like eco-conscious, thinking about uh, the ways that we can change our habits, the ways that we can envision uh, more sustainable futures. And so at the end of coming out of that kind of like transcendental experience, you entered into this third dome. And this third dome invited you to share your vision of the future. What would uh, your kind of eco-conscious, climate-conscious future look like? The primary interface for what that looked like for participants was a tablet that was their portal for uh, kind of engaging with that uh, dialogue. The imagery that we generated for this was actually uh, largely done with stable diffusion. Uh, and if you've done any text to image prompting before, uh, some of the unique challenges that come along with that are that the proliferation of a very long prompt does not necessarily generate more specificity uh, in the image that you create. And so we were trying to be very conscious of how do we uh, kind of steer our participants through the formation of an idea that isn't necessarily uh, kind of just open context. Like, I don't necessarily want to give you like just an open text field to write anything you want. Especially because we had tours of middle school and high school students that were planning on coming I to this never, experience. I would never write, write something anything salacious. Yes, or, you know. Ever. ever. I can't imagine. So what that ended up meaning is that we had to think of content creation from the beginning. We were like, hmm, we could do like Mad Lib style prompting so they can like maybe fill in words. And then we were like, eh, if we can safeguard from all the words they would think of. And so then we were like, well, it's, let's do word banks. And so we ended up making these kind of word bubbles um, that were um, in, made collaboratively with the Visions 2030 team, as well as Minds Over Matter, the other partner that we worked with, as well as some of their uh, community partners. And so it ended up being a series of screens. The first one was about the environment, what kind of space you imagined, community, what kind of structures would there be, solutions, thinking about what technological solutions could be in this future, as well as an aesthetic that kind of informed some of the visual look. We did give them a free response section, so they were allowed to write something that we had to do a bit of content moderation for, but. But the secret was that what didn't actually make its way into the prompt. Yes. So you were allowed to write, you know, poop, 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 if you wanted to, but uh, <laughs> we weren't gonna actually send that along to, someone did. Um, <laughs> someone did do it. <laughs> you know? We said they were going to, and they were like, no, no one would do that. They did. Um, I know, because we were curating. Um, so one of the interesting pieces about this is that after you filled out, uh, after you kind of completed your uh, portal experience, um, what would happen is that your uh, generated image would show up on a large screen in this kind of like nine screen circular environment. Um, the screens are like 85 inches, so they're an impressive size, and they're suspended like waist height or so, and so you had a moment where the vision that you created showed up in like larger than life um, style before it then wrapped back around into a gallery that lived on the interior circle for the experience. And essentially what, how they knew it was their vision is that they would complete it, there would be like a 30 second loading screen and then they would see their vision and it, they it would be emailed to them and that's how they knew kind of where, uh, what, where it was in the space. This is just a few of the images that were generated uh, through the process. One of the interesting elements that we considered was we actually did uh, some additional image-to-image uh, -image generation to kind of supplement the text. And that allowed us to kind of ensure that there were thematic consistencies both in color and composition for the images that were generated. Yeah, and uh, as part of the project, we also created an online gallery. Uh, the dream for Visions 2030 is that they would hold this festival in multiple cities, and they would see kind of what are the trends in various cities? What are folks imagining uh, and dreaming about? Uh, folks did write really poetic and beautiful things. We did see like a lot of like 
the, the question was like, what do you envision for your future if there's anything we left out? And so we did have some like nice poetry that folks wrote. We also got some like all caps, fancy, fancy fun. fun, pretty crazy. Dinosaurs. 1,000 new animals, please. 1,000. <laughs> there were other things that were definitely not okay that we had to curate. And essentially what we would do is like every day we would just kind of pull it up and then we would see what folks, what folks had done. I think my favorite, so this is like a very silly thing that happened, but someone figured out that there was a way to engineer the, the, your responses so that you would get back cars in a psychedelic, like hot pink background. So we had a series of like muscle futuristic cars or like weird Tesla cyborg cars. Like 20 in a row. Like 20 in a row. It's like they went to all the tablets and they were like, okay kids, this is what we're gonna do. And then they just went through all of them and it was, it was a wall. It was a wall of just like psychedelic pink cars. Muscle car. Muscle cars, it was, it was, it was nice. <laughs> It was, I will say that the other interesting part of this is that getting to reflect on what people generated and seeing the gallery online was a really interesting perspective for seeing how visitors kind of envision futures and the kind of consistencies and sometimes inconsistencies in the way that they generated images and thought about what a kind of future or eco future might look like. Yeah, I think it was a really interesting project for us because we worked with AI and machine learning in the past. You know, we've done work with image recognition um, and with the kind of proliferation uh, of conversations around AI, we, I feel like recently have become more wary of it uh, and had kind of more skepticism, have distanced ourselves from it a bit. Uh, and then this project came up and we're like, oh, this is actually, hmm, this is an interesting idea. Uh, there were friends who had invited us I invited us to work on it. We're like, okay, this seems like it could be something that, you know, could be an interesting use of image generation. Yeah, I think the other piece for us is that any any new technology, right, like there's, it's worth having some skepticism about it. And I think there's very complicated conversations around what is uh, image generation as a technique uh, and the ownership and ideas about where that comes from. And I think one of the pieces for us that was really important to think about in the project that we're gonna kind of discuss next is trying to bring some critical conversation to what that looks like and what it means. Uh, and then also making sure that we don't forget some of the heritage and the places that we come from as we uh, generate images and think about their representations. Yeah, I feel like it was a moment for me where I realized, uh, well, I can't really be an ostrich with my like, head in the sand about this, because if I am and I don't engage with the technology, then who will be the people engaging with the technology? How will it continue to potentially be used in, a, in only militarized ways? How can we think about you know, injecting our own thoughts and visions about how to use the technology? And so that's, it was kind of, we were coming back from Mexico City because we had just taught a workshop there. And it was uh, around the time, it was October, this was recently, it was a month ago, not even. And we were doing some work uh, at Arizona State. We were giving a talk. And we were like, okay, we have an opportunity to put work up in Arizona. What should we do it on? And we were like, well, there's gonna be a Dia de Muertos festival. We should, you know, we should tap into that. We should think about how uh, we can engage with that. And so we created Calaveras. This is not a sugar school. Uh, this piece had kind of two primary modalities. One of them was this large outdoor uh, LED screen that overlooks a kind of large park space. And so this is kind of a more of a kind of 10 or 1920 sized screen. And then there was inside of uh, the kind of lobby there, there was a super long, like 16K long uh, screen uh, that this piece was also featured on. And what we wanted to think about is we wanted to kind of pose a kind of question of, uh, and kind of, play with the idea of this is not a sugar skull, right? This is, I mean, it looks like a sugar, sugar skull, sure. Um, but it's really a machine's hallucination of how a collective uh, collection of images and ideas and semantics relate to what a sugar skull might represent. So part of our process was to curate a large set of prompts that were not necessarily uh, explicit about what we were trying to generate, uh, and then to prompt the system in both English and Spanish to try and see if there are going to be any variations and changes. And then to also use a variation of the image that was generated uh, to produce this petal-like structure that emerges from this kind of swirl uh, and then disappears as well. 
Yeah, I think it was really because uh, these images, right, they're generated by machines. They're trained on images, real images, sometimes fake images. And so we were like, how can we, uh, we're like, well, it's like, it's like the treachery of images. It's like Magritte's The Treachery of Images. It's happening once more, you know. These images are, they're, you know, a machine's generation. It's a machine's uh, creation of, you know, our cultural existence. And so that's how we got to kind of creating this sort of ephemeral reflection on Dia de Muertos. Here we have a kind of example of what the prompts look like. We represented the prompts both in Spanish and English uh, for users to see them when they're both in the long format view in the lobby space and then also for that kind of like large outdoor screen. To give you a sense of what the matrix looked like, we tried to think about themes that explored time, liminality, uh, worlds, our body, our soul, right? These like complex ideas that don't aren't necessarily kind of well represented inside of uh, what you might put in an image. Uh, and to try and ask a more kind of esoteric question about what is the sugar skull dreaming or thinking? Yeah, I think especially with image generation, you're like, okay, I want a field with a llama eating soup and it's sunny and also there's a rainbow. You're, and Sasquatch. And, and a Sasquatch is hanging out. You know, you're very explicit. Uh, at least that's what, what we learned when we were doing all of our training and our examination. And so we were like, what is the, rather than creating a very objective prompt, like give me this, it was what is the, what is the poem, what is the dream, what is the imagination? And, you know, what will the what will the images be that it generates? And the results were really interesting. They were beautiful, right? I think the, the other piece for us here was to try and think about how this amalgamation and collection uh, is you know, interesting and compelling in its own right and is not trying to present itself as being necessarily like, I'm not saying this is like, is the thing and I'm not trying to sell you as like, this is the thing, but instead I'm trying to provoke a question of, uh, is the dream of this machine, this kind of collective soup of semantics, uh, moving us in a direction that's compelling or interesting? Yeah, and it felt really kind of timely and beautiful to be making this piece about the other muertos, thinking about grief, thinking about loss, thinking about longing, um, and kind of holding space for that. It was really nice because it was during the festival, and so the piece kind of went up as part of the community festival as well, and so it was really nice to kind of give that back to Mesa as well. Yeah, that's just a little bit about us. That's a little quick snapshot. Yeah. Thank you very much for having Thank us. You. I think we're going to hang out for a few Q&A pieces. Oh, yeah, you got it. I just stood up. Does anyone have any questions for these fantastic artists? So uh, I guess I was just curious um, how when clients come to you, depending on their background, their skill sets, like is it always kind of a, 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 a kind of gray process when you try to figure out how much technical support am I bringing to this project? How much more of it is creative concepting? Because like in the first example you showed, the, the team that you were working with has a pretty good technical mm -hmm. skill set. So could you speak more to like how you find that line with clients? Yeah, so coming from the like production producing background, I'm like, yeah. Um, so a bit about our process. We, there was a lot of learning in the first year of our business, uh, especially kind of working with different kinds of clients. Uh, we're mostly a software and design studio. A lot of the times we work with other design agencies to kind of help make their um, dreams come to life, but we also have worked with other kinds of partners. And what we've kind of developed as a way to kind of safeguard what it is that the objective is for a project is to work in phases. And that has been the best way for us to work. And so we have a discovery phase at the beginning of every project where we're like, we'll work with you for two weeks or three weeks to really figure out what you want to do after we've kind of agreed that, yes, we want to partner together. And that's really where we do all the digging. We're like, OK, what is it that you actually want to do? Um, and then from there, if everyone kind of agrees on kind of the outcomes of that uh, time, which is usually a deck kind of pulling together those ideas, we go into a schematic design phase, which is really where 
system diagrams, outlines, all of the kind of nitty gritty pieces of the technology, the hardware, how the thing is going to work. And we get a sign off on that because we're like, this is what we're making, right? We all agree that this is what we're making. And they're like, yes. And we're like, OK, good. This is what we're all agreeing on this. This is great. Um, and then from there, we go into production. So I feel like having that process has been really helpful for us because if not, you get into this kind of slippery area where you're like, what did we, what did we agree to? Yeah, I think that's, to Zoe's point, it's really important to have a kind of structured approach to what that looks like. I think both in terms of making sure you've protected your time, um, but that also gives us a space to really like outline what is it that we need to create in terms of features and behaviors. Um, because that, you know, I think the, the most frightening moments are when you're on site and you're like commissioning a piece and then someone's like, this is great. I love this. And then when does the bubble machine start? And you're like, there was, there, we never talked about a bubble machine. The best moment is when the client goes, oh, this looks just like the renders. Yeah. And we're like, yeah, yeah, that's what we said we were going to make. I'm so glad you feel like <laughs> you're, there are no surprises. You feel good about it. Perfect. That's sometimes very boring, but I think that's, you know, our objective at the end of the day is for the process to feel very boring, but the end product to feel exciting. Magical. Do we have another question? Yeah, I was just wondering what the what the timelines were for um, a project of that scale for you to roll out. It's been many things and anything and everything in between. I think the fastest turnaround we've done is three weeks for a project. And then the longest project we've worked on is uh, the curriculum, which was uh, almost two years from beginning to end. So it really depends on the kind of scope of what we're working on um, and, uh, you know, Sadly, sometimes one of the deciding factors is how much budget is available to expedite pieces that might otherwise be really challenging to put together. Yeah, I believe Frida was four months. Um, they contacted us in February, and then we opened in June, June, I believe. And then um, for Calaveras, we had two weeks. Uh, and so we came back from Mexico and we were like, all right, are we going to show work? Are we going to make it work? And we we're like, okay, but what would we make it on? And then we're like, well, we just learned how to do this thing with the uh, stable diffusion. And so we're like, okay. And we just kind of hustled. Well, thanks for your talk. Um, you, you, for, the, for the last two projects that you talked about that involved um, AI, uh, were there other options you're considering like aside from uh, using those AI tools and like like if those tools like hadn't been available like, like how do you think that would have changed your process like what other options were you considering I guess the client was very committed to using image generation um, we have I've used stable uh, not stable diffusion uh, style transfer in the past style transfer is when you have your source image and then you have a style like a pattern the pattern of my scarf and then i apply that style to the image and so it kind of gives it the uh, look of this scarf but it doesn't change the image per se i had done that work in my thesis and it doesn't necessarily create uh, totally new images i guess or new objects or things like that um, and so since the client was very committed to image generation the process for that looked like testing different um Tools. Different tools. Yeah. Environments. Yeah, we did. So for the kind of lead up process, we did do an analysis between uh, several different kind of available tools in the machine learning space. So we uh, tried DALI. Uh, they were interested in mid journey as a potential approach. Um, we tried, tried to push them away from that just because it uh, there's no sanctioned uh, API for accessing it, which makes it really difficult to have consistent and uh, transactional results. There's a number of kind of offshoot tools that do that for you, but it's, you know, we didn't have a lot of time, we didn't have a lot of time and uh, Ian, who's not here with us, has a rule about the number of adapters mm -hmm. that you can put in line, <laughs> and we were going to be out of our number of adapters for that. We also, we're no stranger to procedural tools, so uh, we've used a lot of procedural design tools in the past, and I think, you know, if we rewound two years or three years and there were no um, kind of uh, image generation systems that existed, we would probably think about uh, tools for creating dynamic collage uh, and kind of dynamic rendering environments for doing some of that work. Thank you for your talk. Appreciate you coming out here. Um, so for the for the Frida 
exhibit um was all of that you know like the you had the like the 3d representation of the space and um you know the i think it was like the playback cues kind of thing was like how much of that was done in touch designer because there were definitely some aspects that looked like it was specifically touch designer yeah the modeling for the environment was done in cinema i think uh, modeling and texturing was done in cinema uh, but the and then the other piece that you see there in the upper right hand corner the um, uh, projection plan was done in mapping matter um, where they made the decisions about which projectors the brightness and their placement um, and then touch designer was really in charge of all of the content playback the particle systems uh, synchronizing them across all the machines all the media elements um, and then all of the user control elements and the dynamic particle system. There was another developer who had a automated um, calibration system that was developed in V4. And so we received uh, UV calibration maps and blend maps from V4. We've done, at Obscura, we did a similar project that was uh, all touch designer. So it's, it could have been either. Uh, the developer they had to do their uh, mapping system just happened to be a V4 expert. Real quick one first, and then um, maybe more open-ended one. The quick one is, what is Ian's rule for the number of adapters? <laughs> Four. I, I think it's five. Five. Yeah. He, okay. He says five, but he gets real sweaty at four. Mm -hmm. Okay, and if you don't want Ian to sweat, then you stay with four. Oh, yeah, four or less. Okay. Um, and then the more open-ended one is, um, I'd like to hear if you have any interesting stories about uh, working with sound and touch designer, since most of the stuff you show is very visually um, prominent, but have you worked with sound in any interesting ways? Uh, yeah, many interesting and sad, tragic ways. Um, it's, yeah, to be you know totally blunt and honest about it, I think that the uh, touch designer is a very frame-centric platform, so it really is more focused on understanding the world in terms of the amount of time in a frame. So predominantly when we do sound work, we typically think about what's the bridge between Touch Designer and another toolkit, whether that's Ableton or Max or PD. Um, usually we try to decouple those pieces and think about how they communicate with one another rather than trying to make them be uh, kind of all in the same place. Yeah, for Frida, we worked with a sound team and they had, a, I think it was a troupe of like 15 female musicians that they recorded and then they played back in this orchestral way. That was the sound that um, played with the video. And so what we did with them is that we worked with them to send OSC messages to trigger specific moments uh, in the piece. And so that's usually what we end up doing for my MFA. I think I used QLab because QLab is, you know, it's a workhorse, it'll do it. And so it was just kind of playing individual tracks. Generally, we keep sound outside of touch designer just because it thinks of things in frames and sound is not frames. And so what will happen is you'll hear clicks and skips in the audio, which you do not want. So yeah, we generally use it on this, like do sound on the side. Yeah, I think some of that also comes from, you know, our, my background in theater, there was always a separate sound designer. And so we typically tried to think about how do we decouple some of this process so that we can both work at the same time and then just agree on how we're going to kind of synchronize and coordinate our efforts for the experience. <clears throat> Hi, I was wondering for the, um, for the last project, did you encounter any like weird, like consistently occurring idiosyncrasies generating images in Spanish versus English? We were actually surprised that Spanish worked. Um, I was like, I don't, I don't know, it was like late night. We're like, well, I don't know if this is gonna work. And it did, which was really exciting. Um, generally with Spanish, um, there was a lot more kind of like distorted weirdness, less perfection. We did see kind of those artifacts in image generation that are like swoopsies that kind of go to nowhere. And you're like, what, what is that? Um, and so um, we were surprised that it worked. Um, between the two, I think it ended up being more like 65% uh, or 70% of the images that we ended up choosing that were English because they just 
were better results. Um, and then about like 35, 40% were in Spanish. But um, I was I was honestly, I was like, okay, yeah, we can do this. We can, it, It'll do it. This is great. Um, we did have to safeguard, though. There was a lot of negative prompting. Uh, Stable Diffusion does not censor what it makes like Dali does. Dali has a censoring um, that they already do. And so we had to because we were asking for calaveras or catrinas, um, it would generate images of women, and we had to do a lot of negative prompting um, to be more specific about what we wanted to see. Yeah, I think the other piece there is that we were very conscientious about the curatorial aspect of working with the image generation. I think if you haven't done that yet, the interesting part of that experience is that as much as you are prompting for a result, you are also collecting a larger sample than you're going to use because you're going to have to cut out some of the responses that come back. And so that kind of curation process um, was a whole part of what we actually uh, did. I think we generated uh, close to 1,300, maybe more than. Um, and then we cut that back to a final result of closer to 300. Another question? I have another audio question sort of related to Heather's question, and that is, so if you keep the audio and the visual separate, does that mean that Touch Designer isn't particularly good for reactive uh, visuals, audio reactive visuals? Uh, uh, Sorry, go ahead, sorry. No, okay, that's okay. what I, okay. that's, that's the question. Uh, I think for, we've done lots of audio reactive pieces. Uh, and, you know, uh, five years ago, I was doing a lot of the audio um, kind of monitoring inside of Touch Designer. So the, all of the kind of like, how do we think about kind of extracting inter interesting information from the audio? These days, I try to think about doing that somewhere else outside of the rendering pipeline. Um, partially so I'm not competing for the resources of what's happening inside of the rendering world. Um, and because I think uh, as much as I love Touch Designer as an environment, it is uh, more pixel-centric than audio-centric. And so you don't have quite the same analysis tools that you might have in another environment. Um, for a project that I did at MGM Kotai, I worked there with a developer who did a huge audio synthesis and analysis application in Max. And so I received a huge set of different channels for control. So it was all the audio responsiveness was being driven in touch by way of synchronizing with, uh, with a Max patch that was actually doing that work. Another question? I had a question. Um, you said that you do a lot of research within your studio, and I wonder like, if you can share anything that's exciting you that pro po isn't popping up in perhaps one of these projects, but is fun and cool and you're into it? Yeah, I mean, I think we've done some work uh, in the last two-ish years on and off with uh, looking at results from LiDAR and then point cloud examples and how do you represent the, the world either as voxels or think about um, points as representing what that looks like. There's a contingent in the forum right now that's actually doing a port of the kind of Gaussian splatting work that's happening on the web right now and doing that in touch. And so I think some of the work that's exciting to me is trying to think about how do we take things that are uh, model-based or LIDAR-based kind of points and then represent that in interesting ways inside of the environment. And how do we manipulate that, interact with it? Yeah, I think uh, it's interesting because this, Cala well, not this project, the Calaveras project that we did was one of the first projects that we did at Pseudomagic that wasn't for anyone but ourselves. And so that was really nice. This year, we've actually had more space to kind of dive, ba dive back into our creative practice. And it was a really interesting experience. Um, and I've been wanting to kind of do more archival work. Um, I'm going to talk to Harrison a bit more. <laughs> um, and so thinking about using personal archives and then kind of thinking about this image generation as well has been uh, kind of an interesting thought experiment. How can we dream of, you know, liberated futures and show those liberated features is interesting. Thank you. Last call. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you.